Welcome to Poland Daily History with me, Nicholas Richardson. In the previous episodes, we have discussed the life of Stanisław Wojciechowski, Poland's second president, who was elected in 1922 and unseated in Marshal Piłsudski's May coup in 1926. In this episode, we will discuss his last years in life and his decision not to sign a German document renouncing the Polish government in exile in London, a decision which resulted in his son Edward being sent to Auschwitz, where he died from typhus. He finally passed away in 1953, uh, the, the same year that Stalinism ended. Uh, but he died uh, early on in the year and he didn't really see it. So uh, you could say that after having uh, fought so hard at the first stage of his life to um, restore Polish independence, then taking part in forming uh, Polish troops in Russia following the, the February Revolution, uh, being very active during the Polish-Bolshevik War, serving as, uh, as, the, as the second president. Um, he was one of those men who, who died in a Poland that was very far away from what they wished it to be. So uh, he died at the age of, of, of 84, at old age, but unfortunately uh, in a poor mental state, uh, also having witnessed the, the death of his son, which was partly well, you can't really blame him for doing what he no, did, no. but uh, at the same time, he, he might have been aware that uh, if he would have given up some of his uh, pride and uh, national allegiance, then maybe he could have uh, spared the life of, of, of his son. So quite a tragic end to a long and eventful life. Indeed. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Adam. Thank you. It is fascinating, isn't it, when you delve into the lives of these people, and of course, we know them from history, but we mm. don't always know the the depth of their personal, mm -hmm. their personal problems, and, and war particularly. I mean, you know, uh, I, the, and some of them, you, you take, for example, the, the British Foreign Minister, later Prime Minister, Anthony Eden. Mm -hmm. um, in the First World War, in which he fought, actually, yes. funny enough, he fought on the same front as Hitler, and they mm. actually did discuss it when they met once. But he lost two brothers in the First World War, um, and he lost his only son in the Second World War. Yes. And we have really no concept. We think, oh, these politicians, they're dreadful people and mm. they make silly mistakes. And yet we don't actually ever really probably understand the, that they are human like the rest of us and they have the same concerns. Not only are they responsible for trying to run the country, but they also have the, the, these personal um, threats or, or, or concerns or worries. I, I agree. And uh, also, it's, uh, you could reflect on the fact that we often discuss these people that uh, were born at, uh, at the end of the 19th century and, and they lived through the First World War, the Second World War, in Poland's case, uh, the introduction of Stalinism in, in, in the country. And uh, sometimes when you compare their uh, life stories with uh, those of us who, who live today, uh, so much more hardship, uh, but also so much uh, more eventful, you could say, uh, whether whether good or bad, uh, highs and lows. But uh, uh, those were times that were very uh, volatile in, in in European history. And of course, people that have been born, especially in in Western Europe, uh, after 1945, uh, they do, they don't realize that these uh, 70 years of peace that we've had on the continent. Is, is something that really hasn't happened it's for... It's really the exception rather than it, the rule. It fact. is an absolute exception, uh, and there is nothing guaranteeing it that it will stay like this forever. Uh, no. This is another uh, common mistake that I think people assume, that uh, just because it's been like this for the last 70 years, it will remain so forever. And often people fail to, to realise mm. that wars and, and conflicts start on the most unlikely of events. I mean, you look at the mm. First World War, it broke out very unlikely that you'd have yes. a war over... Over Bosnia. Over Bosnia, <laughs> or over the, over the death of one person. Yes. Um, and yet, people get excited, the emotions take over, mm -hmm. nobody's prepared to give an inch, and we have this massive conflagration. Absolutely. And, uh, and then we also believe that, well, at least here in Europe, uh, we have given up on this concept of war. And then everybody uh, became surprised when, uh, in Yugoslavia in the 1990s, people from all ethnic groups who were very willing to go to war to defend their ethnic interest as, as the country broke down. Or just recently in eastern Ukraine, when, uh, when people felt that uh, their, uh, the, the, the status of their language or their political status in the country was about to change. And they were also very willing to grab, to grab weapons and, and go to war. Uh, so it's, it's never really far from us. And the fact that in Western Europe, we have managed to avoid this now for, for seven decades, 
uh, is something that should be celebrated, but it shouldn't be assumed that uh, no, this we, is a normal state. The world is a dangerous mm. place. We can't take it for granted. And have a look at Russia, what's happening in Russia, uh, which I think is less of a threat. But China mm. is clearly a threat. Absolutely, and uh, we also forget that uh, Europe, it had such a position for centuries that uh, wars would only take place between European powers. Uh, and these incursions of non-European uh, military powers, whether the Mongols or the Ottomans, uh, are viewed like something from ancient times, uh, something like uh, the wars between the, the Roman Empire and the, and the Sassanid Persians, for example. Uh, but there is nothing that uh, technically stops uh, a power. Of course, there are huge uh, geographical distances. But a navy can travel anywhere in the world. Well, and of course, that was the that was the British experience. <laughs> oh yes, of the navy. You you didn't. We saw the sea as both a, a defence between us and continental Europe, mm. but also a highway to link together uh, the various. Mm. Um, overseas territories which formed part of the then British Empire. Yes, and looking at the expansion of the, uh, of the Chinese Navy uh, and also the, the simultaneous uh, stagnation, you could say, in uh, there are simply aren't resources for the US Navy to keep spending the money that they once did on their Navy. They, they still have uh, a large advantage that has, has been built up uh, over decades, but it's quickly being uh, eroded. Uh, Adam, I'm just going to have to interrupt you there. As usual, the studio clock is blinking in the corner, saying that we must bring this episode mm -hmm. to a halt, but we will, with your permission, take up the story next time. There we are. I've had to stop Adam almost in mid-sentence. But we will be back on Poland Daily History in the next episode to pick up where we left off. Thank you for watching, and do join us next time on Poland Daily History.